this presentation will be uh, a synthesis between theory of constraints and some cheese. This smiley guy is me. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Spiros. I'm, I'm based in Cyprus. And uh, at the moment, I'm the exports manager of uh, Haralabidis Christis. This is the largest uh, dairy in Cyprus at the moment. The company makes about 100 million euros. And we're uh, 600 people working there. It's the only dairy that produces all the range of products, like uh, yogurts, cheeses, pasteurized products, and long life products as well. So what I would like to share with you is the experiences that I got from the design and implementation of the theory of constraints. And I would like to highlight the difficulties that we faced, so you can gain something from uh, our experience, and to highlight also the fact that we had no automation or no software to capture data, follow up buffers, and so on. So I would like to share this, uh, these things with you. So a bit of uh, marketing. Huh? <laughs> what is halloumi? Halloumi is uh, our traditional cheese in Cyprus. It's a semi-hard cheese, uh, with no mature cheese, which means that you can produce it today and you can consume it tomorrow. It's a cheese where we add mint, then we fold it in the middle. The special characteristic of this cheese, besides of being Cypriot, is that it has a, a high melting point because of the structure of the proteins. And this makes it ideal for uh, barbecue purposes. And this characteristic gives to the cheese a very high seasonality. It's almost like ice cream. So if we have a very good summer, we sell a lot. If we don't have a good, su a good summer, then we don't sell a lot. The seasonality during the, the high season, we sell almost three times more than what we sell during the winter. So this uh, presentation will follow the, the logic of change, if there is one. So first of all, I'm going to explain why to change, then what to change, then what to change to, and finally how to cause the change. So by starting with the why to change, this is the world market of halloumi consumption. Okay, there is a natural growth of the halloumi of 20-25% of increase every year. So in the last seven years, the sales, the consumption, there are four times more than uh, uh, what it used to be. So this is for all the halloumi that's been exported from Cyprus to all over the world, to Europe, New Zealand, to Taiwan, to whatever, okay? And here is the way to change. This is the growth of, uh, that we had in our company, okay? Up to 2010, 2011, if we go backwards, there is a straight line for the last 15 years. We were producing the same amount, Somewhere here we introduced some concepts of the theory of constraints and from that time we have almost doubled the sales. Okay, So up to 2010, we didn't know what would happen, the board of directors took a decision to buy in another plant, in another cheese plant, so we can add to our, uh, to our capacity. At that time, I was the supply chain manager of the company, and I was offered the management of the operations. So I had the opportunity to take a closer look into the process and offer my opinion. So I formed a small team with the production manager and the technical manager, who were friends also. And we divided the halloumi process in six main steps. Okay, I'm going to explain to you the steps so you can know how to make halloumi after this. <laughs> <laughs> so the first step is the coagulation process. Okay, this is the process where you get the milk, you add rennet into the milk, then the coagulation starts, and the outcome is the curd. Okay, the curd 
is what flows into the molds. You press them and you form the individual halloumi pieces. Okay, this is the outcome of the, the first step. The second step, it's the boiling of those pieces. We take those pieces and we boil them, okay? And when you boil the cheese, it becomes pasteurized. Before that, it was not pasteurized. The next step was to manually fold every piece. So you take every piece and you fold it together. And then it's still hot. Okay, this is a manual process. And the next step is to take these folded pieces and put them into cooling tunnels where you try to bring the temperature down. Okay, so the the cheese is suitable for the brining uh, for the brining process. Okay, you take the halloumi, you put it into the brine, you leave it there for eight ten hours, and next day you can we can vacuum pack it. Brining is salty way. Okay, when you coagulate the milk you have two products. One is the curd that will become cheese and the whey that usually you make soft cheeses and the rest of it you throw it away. If you take that whey and you put salt in it, it becomes brine. Right? So this little st stock there that t we have for the brining process, it divides the whole flow into two smaller flows. One the manufacturing one where you make the cheese and the other one where you pack it. In this presentation, I would like to focus on the on the manufacturing side. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> this is the tra uh, this is the tradition of the cheese first, and secondly, they used to put fresh mint in the middle of the cheese. So when you fold it, you keep the 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 mint into the cheese. So when you put it in the brine, it doesn't float. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a good way to avoid screwing <laughs> the mint into the cheese. <laughs> so it's I it is basically a simple line, okay? It's a straight line with uh, five categories of products. So we have the, our normal halloumi, we have halloumi light, we have halloumi burgers, we have halloumi cubes. We have different five different categories, okay? So it's a straight line, but we have many different packaging formats, many different packaging weights. So you can buy the halloumi in 200 grams, 225 grams, 250 grams. You can buy it in a sleeve carton, in a vacuum pack. You just try to be creative, okay? So the, the first thing that I had to do, it was to go into the process. I looked carefully to find out what was uh, what, what what was wrong or what was the opportunity okay but before doing that i will tell you a bit about the situation how it was we could produce 9 tons of halloumi cheese every day 10 hours okay now with a lot of effort we could go up to 11 tons per day but not for long we needed to unshift just to clean the place. Okay, the factory is 25,000 square meters and almost not the half of it, one third of it is the cheese plant. So you need to, to clean the whole place, so we need several hours to do that. So during the high season, we could go up to 11 tons per, per day by squeezing more people, clean faster, but it's painful, okay? Throughput thinking was absent and capacity was driving behaviors. Now this is the key. And I will add to the previous speakers about flow, okay? If you, if you would walk in the factory and you would talk to people and say, how much halloumi, how much cheese do you produce per hour? They would laugh. They would say, nine tons per day. What do you mean per, kil per hour? Okay? The flow concept was not there. If you wanted to increase your production, you could buy a, lar a bigger tank, a bigger vat, larger pipes, okay? Put more people. The flow concept was not there. So we started analyzing the, the capacity, the flow rate of every step in order to understand 
how the system was behaving, okay? So we started breaking down the steps into the different functions. For example, the coagulation steps is, is composed of different functions, like filling the vat with milk, insert or it, and wait for the coagulation. Start agitation and break the curd, empty the vat, uh, put it in the press, blah, 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 it goes forever, okay? So you decompose the in the smaller functions. For halloumi boiling, for example, is move trolley to the vat, put the trolley into position for boiling, wait for the boiling process, take the trolley out of the vat, blah, 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 all these different functions that you have to do. So we started measuring every, every function, how long it takes. These things, we did it in 2010, okay? The factory is in operation from 1969. We relocated in 1985, but the process is fairly the same. Most of the people, they are still working in the plant, and we didn't know all these things we had to, to measure. Because when flow is absent, okay? So, we came with these beautiful numbers. So this was the flow through the manufacturing plant. The, the coagulation step could produce 1,495 kilos of halloumi per hour, 1,240 kilos per hour, and so on. Okay? So it was easy to see that the, the constraint was the boiling step. 1,240 kilos per hour, working 10 hours, we should be able to produce 12, 12 tons. We were very skeptical now, all of us. We could produce 12 tons. So what we did, we walked to the boiling vats and we started observing the operation. And we realized that one third of the, vat, of the vats, they were empty. Okay, we were taking advantage of two thirds of the constraint. Of course, now it was making sense because you, were, you knew that it was the constraint. You knew that there is a flow. You, you, we started seeing rivers in front of us, okay? Because there are other supporting flows around it to make this thing work. So we started discussing, because we, real, we realized what happened, and we started discussing of increasing the flow of the coagulation step to fill up the tanks. Okay, we moved to the exploitation of the constraint. And I said, this is easy. Okay, this is something that we can catch fast, a low hanging fruit. At least this is what I thought. When I told them to, to speed up the flow, I had 1,000 different reasons why we cannot do it. We can be very creative, huh? So I decided, with the knowledge that I had back then, to facilitate the building of an evaporating cloud. And try to, to clear up a bit why what is holding back from increasing the flow, okay? So we did. So let's read it backwards. In order to produce quality cheese effectively, we need to fit constantly, constantly the constraint, but, and to do that, we need to have inventory just before the boiling. On the other hand, in order to produce quality cheese effectively, we need to keep the pH levels at acceptable, the pH values at acceptable levels. Okay, pH value is the indication how sour the cheese is. Okay, and to do that, we shouldn't have inventory before the boiling. And now the people that they are the cheese maker, they explain to me why. When you leave the, the cheese before the boiling, since it's not pasteurized, it goes bad. So you have to pasteurize it quickly. So people, because they had the quality values higher than the efficiency values, okay, they were living in this part of the world this part of the world was unknown, so everybody was happy. So we tried to challenge an assumption now. The assumption was that the coagulation process has a higher flow rate than the boiling. When you surface that, it's self-evident what, what needs to be done, okay? 
we needed to keep the boiling at a higher flow rate than the coagulation process. Our constraint was in the wrong position. So we started thinking and discussing how to do that, how to increase the flow. <coughs> and what we did is that we studied the whole line, having in mind the physical considerations and the physical constraints. And we decided to shift the flow to new levels. Sometimes by having more working stations, more vats. To go from here, there, we needed to break down walls, rearrange the space. Okay, it was not that easy to do that. But the new numbers showed, of course, we, we kept, we kept the our principle that the calculation step should be higher than the halloumi boiling one. Sorry, less. Okay, so whatever has been produced, it's been boiled. And we left the constraint into the folding function. So 2,700 kilos per hour, in theory, they should give 25 tons per, uh, per day in 10 hours. Okay? So, instead of, I will not confuse you yet. Now, from going from from going from this state to this state okay there there are many things that needs to be considered because uh, all the steps are involved different technical difficulties at this point others here in every every step is another world so we had to consider different things so i thought uh, again and i'm i'm telling you now because i, I just like to convey to you the difficulty that we faced and what we did to, to go over it. We started building a future reality tree. I didn't call it that at that time because they would throw me out of the door. So I facilitated the building of a future reality tree and we built it one which, is, which it was a high level future reality tree. It was very high level so I it wouldn't help because the people that they were involved in this, they knew the detail. So we started building details into the future reality tree. And more, more detail, and more detail. And suddenly, we reached here, okay? As you can read, <laughs> it's, Greek, it's Greek anyway. I mean, we created something, <laughs> it, it, we created something that it goes over the roof. It was not useful. So I thought of using a, a, a another approach to future reality three. Okay, that of the system engineering process. Now this is interesting. The system engineering process is how to build a system by following three basic steps. The first step is the requirement analysis. Okay, you define your requirements, your desirable effects in our language, okay? And then you identify the main functions that need to be implemented in order to meet those requirements. And you identify those functions and then you identify how well these functions must be performed. So actually, you the, uh, the outcome of the requirement analysis is the functional requirements and the performance requirements with numbers. And then you move to the second step, where you take the main functions, and by decomposition, you break them down in smaller functions. And you do that also with the requirements. So every function has a requirement assigned to it. So you know that if the function is implemented, that specific requirement will be met. And then you, you, you create, oops, and then you create a functional architecture where with a future reality tree you create a logical architecture. Okay? And the third step is that of synthesis. In synthesis you try to identify with what physical resources you will implement 
the functions that you have defined uh, that you have defined in the functional analysis with what specific resources with what specific actions with whom and with what so we followed this process of logic and we built it small future reality trees for every step and we followed those so we are still in the theory of we, we, we are still in the land of theory eh? we didn't bring any wall down yet so the next thing it was to plan how we would manage the process And this is uh, what actually we did also. The, the theory of constraints way to, to manage flow in a, in a production process is the drum buffer rope. So to implement the drum buffer rope, you need a drum, you need a buffer, and you need a rope. Okay? In our case, the drum was the halloumi folding. Okay? And then the rope was the coagulation step which was releasing curd into the system and the buffer we decided to have a buffer of 40 minutes which was translated in five trolleys of cheese so we talked with the guys here just three guys okay three supervisors that your aim is to always keep five trolleys before the constraint if for some reason we go down to three you will call the production manager because something is wrong. So we started having this communication. The one guy was basically at the end of the day, what happened is that this guy, this boiling guy was controlling the whole flow. He was watching how many trolleys he would deliver and he would deliver more. Okay. And then he would shout to the guy behind of him in the regulation to release more curd. After two weeks, they knew exactly what to do. They don't even need any more uh, frequent communication. They knew. They knew the flow rate that they had to keep. So the effect was that we went from 9 tons to 25. We tripled the production. And this happened with an investment of 700,000 euros. Okay, it, it, it was all paid back in seven months. Nothing. And we took in consideration also the other constraint, the halumi, the, the, uh, from the other flow, which was the, the packing machines. But in this, in this part of the flow, we didn't care much because the, the packing machines, they can work three, three shifts. Okay? So in this case, just to protect the drum, we put an alarm in the machine that if the flow runs below 90 parts per minute, the alarm was going on. So they knew that they stopped the machines longer than they should. We didn't need the rope because the, the packing machines, they were next to the brining process, so they were pulling uh, inventory on wheel. Okay? So there was no rope needed. So this is what happened. So uh, a few things about the implementation. Now, we didn't have a software. I didn't know Philip at that time or anyone. I, d I was not involved in the TOC community much at that time. I met Philip in 2013. And uh, so what I, what I did is that I translated the future reality tree directly to a gun chart. We sat down with the team and we, we broke down the different steps and what m needed to be done. Okay. And then we pressed the magic button of Microsoft Project and we knew we the our critical path okay and because i was infected with the toc virus <laughs> i wanted to test the critical chain but the only thing i did it was that i copied the critical path to excel okay i didn't have any any software to to do it so I picked up all the tasks that they were up in the critical path and I put them in Excel and some others, some other tasks that they were not on the critical path that, that they were very important. Okay. So what I actually did 
is that I created three sections into the Excel. Okay? The first section, I had all my formulas. The critical chain, the, the, the start date, the, when the project, the buffer starts, and so on. So I had everything. I was updating only the yellow stuff, which is the today date and the, and the completion of the tasks. And the formulas would give me the two figures in the green cells, which is actually the project completion percentage and the buffer pen penetration. Okay? Now, about this completion dates, days, I had another part in Excel where I put in a column all the tasks of the critical path with all the estimated tasks. And in the next, in the next column, I was entering manual, manually every task that we're, we were completing it. Okay? So these two summations, they were feeding up this part. So the, so the percentages they were calculated auto automatically. And then I was getting these percentages to the third part of Excel. So for every day, I was recording these two numbers. Okay? Every day I was recording, not every day, in every completion of the task, any update of Excel, I was recording that thing. And then I used the, the, the scatter with the straight lines and markers uh, graph of Excel. You put the two limits, 0, 0.0 and 100.100. You define the area, the data that you enter in. It's simple. Uh, I, I sound fancy, but it's simple. And I started following up. Oops! I started following up the, uh, the the progress of the of the chart. Now it it seems that we were accurate. Okay, but we didn't have a lot of choice because when we wanted to run the project, the factory was operating at the same time. So we were doing things in parallel, so we could play around, okay? But we had very limited time when we stopped the factory to make all the changes because the milk was kept coming, okay? I couldn't we couldn't stop the operation for more than 10 days, uh, two weeks maximum. Otherwise, we would throw away milk. It would be a disaster. So this one, it couldn't be <laughs> a, a, another way, OK? So this is what we did, and this is how we reached and we implemented it. Now, the next monster that we have to fight okay, was that of seasonality. The, r the red line is our production capacity, and here is the consumption, okay? So basically, we needed to magically find 600 tons of cheese to cover our high season, okay? I, and, and what we used was the, uh, some basic principle of uh, simplified trap buffer rope, and we operated in the low season, Okay, to build that stock. So when we were entering into the high season, we had our production capacity and we were minimize our stock from what we have built before. So our aim, and how did we manage that? It was that we kept this buffer with one indicator that the ending point of the buffer would be sometime in July, August, where the summer ends. And we wanted to be left here with one week sales, stock of one week sales. Because at this point, there is a dramatically drop of the, of the orders and of the consumption. And if you're left with stock, you have a big problem. OK? So I just copied that before I come here. Before I uh, th this is fresh. So what we actually did, we used our buffer. This is the buffer. Okay, and this is in July the end of the buffer that we wanted to have. So this number of the buffer, it was updated with the pr production, okay? And at the same time, it was reduced with the, with the sales. So we were trying to, 
we are trying to keep this buffer now in order to finish July with 140 tons, which is one week sales. How do you do that? If you suddenly you see that you have a, a higher consumption, you work more. You work Saturdays, you work Sundays, you work during the holidays. So there is some buffer into it. If you have less orders or something else goes wrong with the weather mainly, you drop your production. Okay? So you manage, w we manage the buffer with this way. Actually, there are two ways to, to handle seasonality. Okay? The first one is to invest, to invest in capacity, invest in the flow rate, increase your capacity. And the other way is to invest in inventory. So we did both. When we started, we were producing, we were selling 2,300 tons of halloumi, okay, for, for this, this time of, uh, of the time. And then we invested in capacity and flow, and we moved up to, we elevated the whole system to 3,400 tons with the DBR. And then with the management of the inventory, we ended up to 5,000 tons where we are operating at the moment. And that made us won the Exports Award uh, in 2017. Um, I feel proud about this, not because we tripled the production, but because it happened during the financial crisis of Cyprus and the employment rate was increasing and we were employing. We employed 100 people for that, okay? So this is uh, why I feel proud about, not about the, the triple of production.